So Patty, uh, today's uh, podcast episode is totally different. It's actually a replay of the event that I just did with Stax and NMI. Um, I know you had a chance to go through that as well. Excellent, excellent uh, webinar. Um, I, I was really, you know, it's really insightful. This whole idea of next gen ISO is is yeah. something that that really has uh, has staying power. And yeah. I think the stacks and the NMI presentations were were spot on and highly informative. Awesome. Well, without further ado, since we have a little intro on the event, I'm just going to go ahead and go over. So if you're, again, if you're watching on the video, you're going to get the video version. If you're listening on the podcast, it's going to go just to the audio version. But either way, I think it's fine. You'll get the full value out of the audio. We didn't do a presentation as much as just a conversation. So if you're looking to grow your ISO, you're looking to scale with technology, you believe in integrated payments, you want to innovate in our industry, this really is a conversation you're going to love. So let's uh, dive right into it. Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to this event today. I'm really excited about it. Uh, today, I get the opportunity to um, you know, facilitate a conversation between two companies that I'm very passionate about. One of them is NMI, uh, which has been our podcast sponsor for the last few months and a company that I've had the opportunity to work closely with. Uh, many of you wouldn't know this, but for those of you that use our statement analysis tool, if you use um, our training platform, any of these softwares that we have, <clears throat> we've built those on top of the NMI platform. So we've used the NMI gateway, we've used their subscription model. So I'm very familiar with their technology there. And then what I don't think any of you would know is I have a, a different company uh, that we built out as an ISV that services um, self-storage properties. And we built that technology on top of NMI. And so Myself, my developers, we're all very familiar. We've been extremely impressed with NMI, and I've really been um, impressed with the amount of leverage it's given us. It's given us the ability to just build seamlessly on top of technology that we know and we trust, uh, without having to worry about a lot of other issues. It's like if we had to if we had to rebuild NMI in order to build our technology, it just wouldn't have been feasible. But because we had that base of NMI, we're able to move forward with that. And so I'm going to introduce in just a minute going to introduce uh, Jennifer Sherman from um, NMI. And then also today we have Stax. Uh, so we have Jacques from Stax, who's going to be talking with us. And I'm very passionate about Stax. Some of you might know them from their previous brand name of Fat Merchant. They recently uh, rebranded from Fat Merchant to Stax. And the first time I went out there in Orlando, um, I want to say there was like maybe three or four salespeople. We were in this small office and I was doing a training event and I've had the privilege to be out there several times and um, just see the team there as they've, uh, you know, built really an incredibly valuable uh, company that really now is not even considered an ISO anymore. They've graduated from that and they really have their own um, technology platform. Uh, and so it's just incredible as you see these companies and these companies are actually working together behind the scenes. And so I'm excited about the conversation today. This is really a conversation for those of you who want to take your business, your payments company to the next level whether you're an individual agent, but you know that you have more potential, you know that you could really grow this into something special and you see that potential for yourself. Uh, you see down the road, hey, I could hire some developers. We could build something. We could go after a vertical and we could maybe build some kind of software for that vertical by working with the developer. Uh, for those of you that have a, a larger ISO and you've got, you know, you're doing 50, 60, 100 deals a month, but you know, you're leveraging everybody else's technology, but you really haven't built any brand equity in the technology that you offer. This is an event that I think you're gonna find a lot of value in as you see how Stacks working together with NMI has really created some fantastic things that have generated a lot of buzz, a lot of brand equity, allowed them to raise capital to really scale their business to the next level. And so our topic today quite simply is the next gen ISO. Uh, what is the next gen ISO? Uh, well, that's what we're going to hear from NMI about. And so uh, without further ado here, I am going to go ahead and introduce, uh, let me get it on here. I'm going to introduce Jennifer Sherman. Uh, Jennifer is the Chief Product and Experience Officer at NMI. And let's see here. Let me get Jennifer on. All right, there we go. Awesome. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So tell us a little bit about yourself and about NMI before we jump into the event today. Thanks for having me, James. Um, yeah, my name is Jen Sherman. I have uh, been with NMI for, for three years. I am responsible for 
um, our product, our product management, our, our strategy with respect to our platform, as well as our uh, partner success and our customer service function. So basically, I am responsible for your experience with NMI, whether that is the digital experience or the people experience that you've got with our folks on the front lines. Um, and what is NMI? We are a payments platform. Um, we have been around for about 20 years now. We were just counting wow. it up. Feels like a long time. Um, and you know, I think to your to your point about the the evolution of this industry and and where folks are going and and what the next gen ISO might look like. You know, NMI started because we saw a problem in the payment community. Um, we saw a, a set of payment experts in the ISO, and by, when I say ISO, I mean everything from subagent on through um, next gen ISO um, sort of folks um, who were experts in payments and who were that functional advisor uh, to the merchants, helping them navigate the world of interchange and, and card processing. And how do I take a card present or a card not present um, transaction, helping them get that whole infrastructure set up, but ultimately selling someone else's software. Um, and so what you had was this amazing experience up front, but you lose mind share in their day to day. Um, because at the end of the day, when a merchant logs on to find out the ultimate question that they want to know at the end of every day, which is how much did I sell, uh, they weren't seeing your brand when they were getting the answers to those questions. And so, so NMI was founded um, to, to change that experience for ISOs and to allow them to own the gateway, to own the brand, and to own the merchant experience. And that's who we are. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You know, it's so interesting too, Jim, when you think about there's so many technology companies today, so many fintech companies that are, you know, maybe they provide some services to ISOs or they, they have some kind of reseller program. But can you talk a little bit about how NMI, you know, at least in my experience, has really been founded entirely for the ISV and the ISO to, to like, th this is not, you know, you don't have this direct channel out there where you're going after merchant accounts. I mean, you literally built around that. Can you talk to our audience a little bit about that and, and the rationale? Right, exactly. NMI is fully a white labeled platform. Um, built for the SMB merchant, but not designed, you know, our, our entire company was not designed to sell directly to those merchants. So again, um, our goal was to provide the ISO community or the payment pot, the, the payment expert community, um, the ability to provide a, a branded software experience to their merchants without having to write a single line of code. Um, and so we provided the, uh, you know, a merchant, uh, a merchant onboarding experience, a virtual terminal, a, a library of value added services, all of which would be branded with the ISOs brand, your name on that platform, your colors on that platform, your phone number on the number of who to call um, if they have any questions. So at the end of the day, you have delivered software to a merchant. Um, you are that much stickier to the merchants because they didn't just come to you for those interchange rates. They actually came to you for the backbone of their business and the infrastructure on which they, they run that business. Um, and you could deliver that entire package without having to have um, a technical infrastructure or an army of developers. NMI could do that part for you. Um, and we gradually expanded that portfolio with a, a suite of value added services to make those merchants even stickier and to make them even more successful. Um, just random example, it, for, our, um, for our, our ISO community who sell NMI's vault product, what we found is that the average merchant lifespan on those, for those ISOs is two years longer than for those who don't buy the vault, right? So, so, the, so not only do you get to sell a platform, there's a portfolio of value-added services that can make you that much stickier. Um, solutions like our, an automatic card updater, because we found that 32% of subscription runs fail, and the majority of that is because the card expired. So would you be willing to pay a few cents uh, to keep a third of your transactions flowing smoothly? Um, so it's that sort of solutions that we can sell, and at any stage in your evolution, no matter how large you are, what your footprint is in ISO or, or as an ISV, uh, you can use our products as we are purely an enablement player for the payments professional. You know, Jen, let's go back for one second. You're talking about the vault and then you mentioned um, the subscription um, automation and things like that. So is this a trend that you're seeing where it seems like merchants today, no matter what they are, whether it's a, you know, a pizza shop that's getting repeat orders from people or whatever it is, they are in some way storing payment information um, in a rate that they never had before. Obviously, you have your SaaS businesses. That's all they do. Um, but they're storing payment information. 
how, how does that impact, you know, talking about vault, I'm assuming here, we're just talking about, hey, we're, we're storing credit card information for that merchant. Talk about that trend that you're seeing with merchants and how that is impacting portfolio valuation. I mean, you know, obviously, if you control the if you control the customer data, if you've got that picture of the customer data, you are you are that much stickier to the merchant um, because you're the lifeblood and you are their backbone and you've now got the beating heart of, of their business. And so solutions that allow you to do that are that much more valuable to the merchant. And I think the key to to NMI success is that we've been able to do that by without expanding your PCI scope. Right. right. Let NMI store that data. Let NMI capture that credit card information. Um, let us store it for you securely so that you don't have to go through um, all of the compliance hurdles that we do. Friends don't let friends have to deal with uh, stack compliance. Exactly. If it's at all. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, so what NMI has done is allowed, has built wrappers around these technologies so that um, the, the consumers of that information can, be, can remain outside of PCI scope to whatever extent possible, um, and yet they can still deliver that value. And so that actually then gives us the building blocks for what we're calling the next gen ISO movement or the next gen ISO phenomenon, which is, I think, as, as you've alluded to, that's actually you've told in your own story, James, um, a conversation about how, how folks will transition from purely selling merchant services to also starting to sell software. So um, your example is wonderful. So software for self-service storage, right? And I, I'm assuming that that came about because you were selling to self-service storage and you saw a problem and a lack of software in that industry. Um, and I think a lot of our, of our ISO, we've watched a lot of our ISOs go through that same evolution. That is, they recognize that they are selling increasingly into a vertical and they recognize that the next step in stickiness, okay, so we've sold them the gateway. We own their end to their daily experience. Um, when they go in to see their, their sales for the day, they're seeing our brand. We've sold them value added services. But the next step in making that, that merchant more sticky and more valuable is to actually sell them software that no one else can. Um, and what you've done in, in, in self-service storage is, is to create a package that no one else had um, for a specific vertical that you saw. And so for us, the, the, the distinction between an ISO and a next-gen ISO is someone who's seen the opportunity that you did um, and who went out and you know, hired a, a development team and built an app generally specifically for a vertical that you right. know well. Um, and it's that 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 first move into software that lets you put down roots and start building an empire, right? In a in a in a yeah. way um, that that allows you to land and expand in a vertical that allows you to be that much stickier in that vertical, um, and that that allows you to be seen as more than just the payments expert, uh, but also the person who really is running your business in a unique and differentiated way. Yeah. And I, and I think even taking that a step further with my personal experience is that, you know, when you do want to make that shift and you're like, okay, I'm going to go hire some developers. We're going to build this software. Ironically, you don't want to build too much regarding payments because payments is so complicated. You know, you're, if you're in scope for PCI compliance, it's like ridiculous. And you, you can't mess that up that the payments piece, you cannot mess that up. That has to be done. Right. What, you know, in our case, we wanted to build was, you know, how to, rent somebody a new storage unit, how to track their payments, how to give them a customer portal where they could go in and update their payment method. And so we wanted to build all of that on the front end, but we needed, just like we're going to talk to, uh, in, in a minute to Stacks, we needed somebody in the back end to handle everything else. So maybe before we introduce Jacques from Stacks, give us a little more context. You know, Jen, what are, is that what a lot of these companies are looking for that are coming to, to NMI, these ISOs that are saying, hey, I want to build software, but... I'm realizing that trying to build the payments piece is, is unnecessarily complex when somebody's already done all the work. Yes, I and mean, I think I think that folks come at it from from multiple angles. There are there are the ISOs who say, "Look, I've got this vertical. I, I think I understand it. I have a sense of its right. problems. It's time for me to build software, and I know enough about payments to know that I don't want uh, to have to deal with with the the complexity right. of managing that payment." Um, so, and yes, NMI has the tools for you. So the same platform that gave you a turnkey solution for which you didn't have to write a single line of code to get your brand and your logo out there also gives you the tools to start building extensions onto that platform. 
um, to start building your own applications and to start leveraging the payment infrastructure you already have, the customer vault that you already have, the subscriptions infrastructure that you already have, start leveraging those from an API perspective to build your own. Uh, because when we, because at NMI, we see ourselves as purely an enablement player. Um, and whether enabling you means providing a full toolkit of pre-built solutions, or it means providing you the APIs, the web hooks, um, the constructs and the, the, the solutions so that you can build your own solution around it. Um, for us, those are two sides of the same coin. And so wherever you are in that evolution from, from ISO or even sub-agent, um, or agent of an ISO all the way through to a next-gen ISO or even full-on ISV, um, we've got the payment tools to help you set up um, the, the foundation of your own platform. Love it. Love it. Good stuff. So a uh, little house cleaning here. What we're going to do is if you have questions for Jen, uh, I'm sure many of you will, you can go ahead and type those out in the question box. Um, I'm going to go ahead in just a second here and interview uh, and interview Jacques from Fat Merchant, uh, which is now Stacks. Um, and then at the end, Jen's going to jump back on. So I'm going to uh, turn Jen's camera off here. We're going to introduce Jacques from Stacks. So thanks, Jen. We'll get back to you here in just a minute. Um, so uh, again, my story with um, Stacks uh, which, you know, again, previously Fat Merchant, now Stacks. Uh, my story with them goes back quite quite a ways. And I'm really excited today to be joined by Jacques from uh, from Stacks. Let me get his uh, slide up here. There we go. So Jacques, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Good. Well, I'm, so glad, I'm doing great. I'm so glad you could join us today. Um, I thought you could start us out by just giving us a little bit of background on yourself and on Stacks. Tell us a little bit about the journey and you know what it was like to become the next gen ISO and then to even go past that to really a platform. So I thought maybe at a high level, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Stacks, and then I'll jump into some more specific questions for our audience today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was, uh, you know, before we uh, started uh, Stacks, you know, I was the, uh, the CTO at a tech company. Uh, we did uh, e-prescribing uh, in, the, in the healthcare space. We had a software for that. Uh, and I was really looking to um, get back to my roots. Uh, I have an entrepreneurial background. My family, um, you know, always uh, had their own businesses as well. So it's just sort of like a lifestyle. And I wanted to be able to kind of give back um, to, to that community and to help SMBs. Uh, and so it really resonated with me, um, you know, the fact that, you know, payments uh, was, was still kind of um, archaic, you know, not being able to do everything online and, um, not having everything integrated and connected. And so, you know, really resonated with me uh, when I met Scenario at our uh, local tech accelerator called Starter Studio. And uh, that's when we got together and realized like, you know, between, um, you know, between us and, and our co-founder Sal, um, you know, we can, you know, build something that can really help the SMBs grow their businesses. And so that was really the foundation of it all. Um, just to kind of maybe start from where we are today before, you know, we go all the way yeah. in our journey, um, just so people have context. So Stax is an all-in-one omni-channel uh, payments platform for high growth businesses. Um, we build business management and payment accept acceptance software um, all on a payfac architecture, single API for car present, car not present. I think the, the you know, uh, maybe to differentiate from uh, NMI a little bit is we also provide the payments and we go direct to the market as well, whereas NMI is right. purely an enabler. Um, so I think there's there's a little bit of difference there. But we also have a very um, very robust ISV uh, business as well, where we kind of take all of the technology that we've built on the direct side and we um, enable our ISVs and, and white label that as well. So we there there are some similarities um, there. Um, but you know, as far as uh, as far as early days, you know, with that that moment that I was telling you about when we um, when we connected at a uh, tech accelerator starter studio, um, we basically decided let's 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 figure out what um, you know all of the businesses are asking for. You know they they were getting used to buying software on a subscription basis, and so that was really our focus. Uh, and so we kind of started out of the gate um, as soon as you know we we got the you know ability to to be an ISO um, and and be able to offer payments we built our software in that uh i don't know if you all know how tech accelerators work but you know you join a class it's generally 90 days and in that 90 days um, you will launch your product and there's a demo day at the end of it so that's what we did we built our software product 
um, me and uh, you know my um, my friend Daniel. Um, so two engineers is all it took. We did it in 90 days and we launched our product. Wow, that's fantastic. I love it. So, all right, so let's let's go back now. Let's weave into my end of the story a little bit. If we go back to that accelerator and, and you know, I'm not sure where along this process NMI came into the equation, but talk to us about that. You know, when did they come into the equation? Why did they come into the equation? You know, what was the rationale for parting with them early on and what did that look like? Yeah, so to your point, um, I love, you know, how you explain the process of, you know, building software because your goal is to fulfill a, a solution gap within a, a, a specific space, right? And ours was a little bit more broad. Um, right. So, you know, we started off with, you know, uh, with a you know, invoicing product, virtual terminal, recurring billing stuff, things like that. So we were kind of functionally based as opposed to industry based, but that was still sort of our, right. our, um, our foundation. Um, and, you know, I think when, as we're building it out, like we want to invest everything in features and functionality and things, right think that add add value as quickly as possible. Um, and so we weren't our we weren't our own gateway. So it was really, you know, helpful early on to find good good gateway partners that could help um, you know enable a functionality that we could then put into our you know user experience and deliver to uh, to businesses. So um, so you, you know we we had a number of partners out there, um, but you know what we really fell in love with was NMI's knowledge and the relationship that they built with us and the fact that they really understood our business. A lot of the gateways, um, I would define it as they're very transactional, right? Like this is the price, plug in this data, you know, you guys figure it out. Here's right. some, here's some API keys, whatever. Uh, whereas, yeah. you know, NMI uh, really took a consultative approach with us, really understood like, hey, we're trying to like make this a fluid experience. So, you know, how, how can we you know, integrate our technology in a way that um, provides the, the best, you know, usability from, from a, sure. a business standpoint. And so, and so Jacques, when you think about um, other ISOs that are on the event right now, um, they've never built their own software. Okay. So, you know, they're a, basically they're a sales organization. Maybe they have some support staff, right? Uh, maybe they have, you know, tech support for their terminals, you know, that's the extent. And they do, they're, they're seeing these gaps, maybe in a, it's in a specific vertical that they've been going after and they've been going after, you know, attorneys or whatever. And so, okay, I see this gap. Um, at, you know, what is the decision making process of this buy versus build? You know, every developer's uh, kind of dilemma of like, okay, do we just go out and use somebody else's or do we build our own? Can you talk a little bit about that decision and what that decision was like for, um, you know, stacks early on of, you know, do we do we build our own stuff here, or do we just go white label somebody else's? Talk talk about that decision for our audience, if you would. Yeah, I mean, so so hopefully we serve as kind of an example of how fast this can grow, right? Like we right. built our business, so it's been six years since since you know you, you we kind of met you and and you helped yeah. out sort of our sales team with with uh, crafting crafting their pitches. Um, but in those six years, we now have eighty seven ISV partners. Uh, we have, you know, 20,000 clients um, and we, we process, you know, over 15 billion in payments, right? So we just did that in six years. So, right. it, it, you know, having that growth mindset means that when you're making that buy versus build decision, the question for you is, what is the fastest way that I can bring value to my end users without compromising their experience? Sometimes that means building you know, building an extension of something that you already have. And sometimes it means, you know, buying services um, from an enabler uh, like NMI. And so you can, you can, and, and also, you know, you can choose the wrong partner as well there. So it's really important to understand that you choose a vendor that has, um, or partner that has vision um, so that, you know, as the industry is changing and growing, like NMI has done a great job of continuing to expand you know, their, their, uh, technology assets. Um, you know, we've, we've never had to use sort of the, um, you know, cause, cause we built our te own technology right out of the right. gate, but it was really nice to know that NMI had merchant facing technology, right. Um, that they had a mobile app and that they had a virtual terminal. So, you know, if, if we weren't of the mindset that we had to build everything ourselves, if, uh, if we were starting, you know, starting out and may maybe had a, a slightly different mindset, um, it's it's really nice to choose a partner like NMI 
knowing that they have those those uh, white label products there, but that also we can scale and shift into our own technology if we didn't right. have it on day one. Yeah, and I think like one example I could even give of that that's interesting is like for us, you know, the first few self storage properties that we sold, uh, we actually did just put them on the a branded version of the NMI gateway, right? And it was like, let's just, you know, you just go in there, you, address, you know, you could do some of the stuff, you know? And then while we're building our, our technology and then we were able to just, you know, seamlessly transition because we had everything stored in the NMI vault. So we were able to use the same keys and all that, you know, to, to dive into it. So I think it's interesting to scale up. So let's talk about the scale for a minute. So obviously where you're at now versus where you were at <laughs> five, six years ago is like crazy different, you know, huge, huge scale. And we're, I'm always seeing the, the latest news article of the capital raise or the expansion, the growth. So talk to us about your relationship with NMI over the last few years as you have really, really scaled up. What is that relationship like, you know, today? And talk to us about that evolution of kind of evolving with a partner like that that's taking care of a lot of the back end processes. Yeah, like I said, before we became our own, um, you know, our own gateway and had our own own connections, you know, NMI really helped us accelerate and get our product into the market um, as quickly as possible. You know, now that we have our payment facilitation. Sure. Uh, license. We also provide uh, the payment power of the payments ourselves as well. Um, but you know, there's still areas where NMI has, uh, you know, frankly, uh, been been able to to help us continue to expand our offering without being slowed down um, through you know software development and and all of that you know product product release cycle. You know, one of those key areas today um, is like EMV certifications. You know, the fact the breadth of the processors that they right. have you know integrations with on you know from a from a hardware perspective um is is fantastic so you know that's still part that you know we uh we leverage uh, them today um for for some of some of their hardware um you know as far as scale you know look i mean we're we're pretty big business now i can tell you that you don't have to worry about scale um picking a partner like nmi and so that's a kind of a key question Yep. You know, just a general advice I would give is how we got to where we are today is really thinking about what are the things that will break if we 10x our business today, right? Like if we 10x yeah. our business, can we, could, you know, could we still do, you know, um, you know, keying in data on applications and, you know, sending DocuSigns or something like that? Like, no, we can't, right? Like we, we wouldn't survive at 10x. So then we built our own onboarding experience, right? right. And then right. like, if if we're you know doing all of these uh, merchants and having to go back and forth uh, from an approval standpoint, um, you know is could we could we survive that on 10x scale? The answer was no. So we built our own payment facilitation technology and our own payment facilitation you know team and risk and underwriting. And we built all those those tools out. Um, and and so really that's what it comes down to is kind of look at every process from onboarding servicing, development, transactional volume, and just 10X it in your mind and what what's not going to work well. And those are the areas that you want to focus on. Um, you know, I think it's easy to be like, oh yeah, we can handle double, um, but but that doesn't give you sort of your North Star. Right. So that's why you really need to 10X any of the numbers that you have today if you really want to focus on high growth and make sure all of those bottlenecks are, are ironed out. Love it, love it. So, um, you know, my last question here is maybe a little bit of a general one, um, but I'm just curious as you look back at the last six years and your experience there, and you're talking to our audience of, you know, ISOs, even in it, mean, you know, Sanira, for those that don't know, I mean, the founder, she was an individual agent in the industry, right? Before this. Yeah. She did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, she saw some things in our industry that she wanted to improve, that she wanted to change and wanted to innovate. And I know there's many listening and watching right now that are in that same mindset. I really, I want to innovate. I, you know, I, I want to do something in the industry. I want to make a difference. I want to make an impact. So I'm curious what general advice you'd have for them. Maybe even there's some things when you look back the last six years where you say, ah, I, we could have done this better. We could have done this different. So what, what tips, tricks, insights do you have from the last six years that you'd share with our audience that kind of want to get to where, uh, you know, Stacks is at today? Yeah. I mean, I think the 10 X test is a key, key part of that, that I mentioned before. Um, if you want to grow, you just, you have to have the infrastructure. That means people, processes, tools, like all of that sort of has to support that growth. Um, and then I would also say, you know, focus on your, like focus, like have a, have a priority. Like if, you know, you, you, you chose self-storage for, um, your, your, 
you know, first foray into to the ISV space. Um, I'm sure a lot of the ISIS and agents there, you know, kind of have a particular niche that, you know, that that they know really well. That's where you need to focus your time and energy, not just to get try to get the wrong type of customers. So I, you know, for us, it was really about getting the right type of, type of customers. Um, you know, all of ours were established businesses, more sophisticated, high growth, um, and and needed, you know like omni-channel capabilities. Like we never, we never went after restaurants or anything like that, right? Like that just right. wasn't our, our thing. Um, and so knowing, you know, picking your lane and sticking to it is, is really key to that growth and doing things that other people can't do at scale. Um, you know, when you look at the traditional acquirers and processors out there um, or, you know, the, the other, other tech companies in the space, like, you know, Square or something like that, they can't have the relationship that you do or the deep expertise within industry that you you can develop um, at, as a, as you know a, a smaller group um, so those are the things that you know you can use to your advantage to to really grow yeah I love it. I love it. Well, I would like to personally thank both of you. I know your schedules are insane. I get that. And so I really appreciate you taking the time, carving that out this morning to share with our audience. I know a lot of people are going to get some inspiration and some innovation is going to be the result. So thank you both for your time. Um, If you have a question that we didn't answer, I didn't get to it. Don't worry about that. I'm going to send those over to the appropriate people. Um, we'll get some responses to you. Um, and then, of course, we'll post the uh, replay. So I've asked about that. We'll have the replay up on social media as usual. Uh, so again, thank you both very much, Jen and Jacques, for taking time this morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you, James. Take care. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, you know, James, um, I got some interesting um, news and some positive news out of MasterCard um, with regards to small businesses that I wanted to share with everybody this week. Yeah. Uh, MasterCard conducted a study of the impact of, co of the COVID crisis on businesses in 19 markets around the world. And it found, not surprisingly, that sales at small and medium-sized businesses lagged larger companies uh, by about 20% at the peak of the crisis. So you're saying the, the, the smaller companies, they had 20% more of a drop than larger companies? Than larger companies, Okay, correct. got it. All right. Okay, which is not totally surprising no. when you think about it, you right. know. Um, but, but spending is now on a strong recovery path, and in fact... Total sales at SMBs rose 4.5% rose, um, during the first eight months of this year. Wow. Uh, that was compared to 2020. And um, interestingly and not surprising, I would say, e-commerce sales were up about 31%. Sure. That's 31% over 2020. Yes. Now that, to me, that actually that is a little is bit surprising. That is very interesting, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's like, okay, well, that, you know, that I was mean, when everybody was just doing e-commerce. So. But it's like, because that momentum, yeah. once it kept, once it started, it just crazy. kept rolling, right? Yep, that's amazing. Um, so here's a couple other highlights that I found. Uh, in the U.S., one in four small retailers that closed in April of 2020 remained closed after six months versus one in 12 large retailers. Mm. Now, wow. of course, the biggest drawback for small retailers was not having the resources to pivot to online sales. Right. You know, there were also some businesses that just couldn't go to online. Thing, you know, I think here of barbers, hair right. salons, right. Uh, sure. gas stations, right? I mean, there's some sure. that just couldn't do the pivot, right? whether they had the technology or not. Right. But here's the what, what really blew my mind, and it goes back to this e-commerce. The number of businesses going online tripled between early 2020 and early 2021. And the um, rate of existing brick and mortar businesses ex uh, expanding into digital um, has continued to persist at elevated levels. Yeah. Um, digitally enabled small businesses saw some of the largest increases in customer spend and transaction numbers. What's more, MasterCard said that 34%, so one in three SMB e-commerce sales were purely incremental hmm. and would not, have would not have occurred if those stores had stayed as brick and mortar. Wow. I wow. think that's a, you know, yeah. and, 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 and MasterCard pointed out that in many cases, it, and I, you know, I, I've seen this in several, the, some of the reporting I've done with the green sheet, in many cases it's because by going online, even 
the mom and pop shop in Altoona or Frederick, you know, mm -hmm. could offer the goods globally. Right. Right. You know, I had a just earlier today, I'm I'm going to a wedding in a couple of weeks and and the theme of the wedding is Western. Mm. Okay. Sure. I don't have a lot of cowboy gear. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> not, what, not, what a shocker, huh? <laughs> right? Right a shocker, right? So I had to go online today and look for cowgirl shirts. Mm. And I found a store out in like New Mexico. Oh. Huh. I mean, I did all, I looked at, you know, Amazon. I looked at, a, you know, uh, Tractor Supply, a few different places. Yep. Couldn't find, even one on Etsy, couldn't find what I wanted. But this store out in New Mexico is it, it's going to ship me my cowgirl shirt. Wow. Um, and yeah. they would never have gotten my business otherwise, you know? Right, of course. So I think mm -hmm. that that, you know, and you can take it out globally as well. Um I mean, how many of the things that we buy online, especially from Amazon, are from Taiwan, Korea, right. Right. <laughs> China, you know? Yes. So uh, so here's the other thing that really shocked me. Um, in the U.S., new small small and medium-sized business formations are up were up 86% in 2020 compared to 2019. Mm. Wow. So even, though of the, even with the pandemic, more small businesses were opening. Now, we all know that, you know, and as the other data shows, a lot of small businesses closed up shop, too. So, right. you know, where does this, you know, but I thought it was interesting that um, small new small business formations were eight times higher. The rate was eight times higher than that for large businesses. Yeah. And uh, here's another interesting statistic. Again, not totally surprising, but it, it's interesting to put some some uh, meat behind the, the speculation. Uh, spending in central business districts remains off roughly, remains roughly at about two thirds of pre pandemic levels, mm. uh, whereas spending spending in outer districts and suburbs was far less impacted. So here's an example: in New York City. Uh, this, in the business district, you know, like the financial district in the theater right. district, right? Right. Um, spending was roughly one third of in, in August of 2020. It was roughly one third of August 2019 spending. Mm. Okay. Wow. Whereas spending in residential neighborhoods like the Upper East Side in Brooklyn was at 85 percent of 2019 mm. levels. And wow. and they there's they gave similar um, changes in, in that they charted out in cities like Miami, Atlanta, Denver, L.A. Sure. So you know, and again, I think that's because more people are at home, so they're yep. running out to local bodega rather than um, spending at the at the local uh, lunch counter, right? Right. So um, huh. so anyway, uh, here's what, how Mastercard's uh, chief economist put it. Supporting neighborhood businesses has been a rallying point throughout the pandemic. However, the challenges faced have been very real due to the dependency on local markets, local supply chains, and tighter cash flows. Mm. Um, he added that brighter opportunities lie ahead. The shift to digital opened the door to the pandemic's silver lining, he said, mm. a resurgence of entrepreneurship and innovation. Wow. Um, so I just think, you know, I mean, it's nothing that totally should totally surprise any of our listeners, but it's really interesting to have some of the meat behind the speculation. Yes. You know, to understand that, yeah, you know, if you had a lot of accounts in Manhattan's financial district, you know, <laughs> yep. you, you better have balanced that off with some, uh, some accounts on the Upper East Side or Brooklyn or right. Queens or something, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting, so, Patty. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.